Good morning, Solano. My name is Hewitt Shankut, and I have the privilege of um, reading the scripture for today's word. Um, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the whole chapter, and I invite you to take your Bibles out and read along with me. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated, even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I write to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or as an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is, not those, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. This is God's word. Thank you, Hewitt. It's fair to say this is one of those difficult passages in the Bible that we're going to be preaching on here today. And uh, I even uh, contacted Hewitt and our scripture reader second service um, during the week. And I said, please read this passage and pray over it and pray for me. Uh, I don't normally do that. And, you know, we're uh, just, if you're just joining us or you're kind of new to Solano, we didn't just pick this passage like out of the blue, like, man, we really want to preach this passage. The, we're, we're journeying through the book of 1 Corinthians. And part of uh, what we want to do as a church is we want to obey God's word. And so we don't want to be selective about what part of scripture we teach on and what part we ignore. And so by going through the whole book of the Bible, it forces us to have to reckon with passages like this. Um, And so I want to just take a minute and orient us in the book of 1 Corinthians because we're at a transition point in the book, and we'll see that in our sermon series as well. Right, The first four chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing the root of their problem. The Corinthian church is in a state of fighting and quarreling, and they have controversy. And he identifies that root problem, which is they're trying to do church the world's way. They're applying the wisdom of the world to how to be God's people, and they're not learning to rely and live by God's wisdom, which can look like foolishness to the world. And what he's gonna remind them of He's going to say that wisdom of God that the world thinks is foolish is what gave us Jesus Christ. It's what gave us Jesus to be our salvation by dying on the cross. And that kind of salvation is foolishness to the Greeks and it makes no sense to the Jews. But we believe and understand it is our salvation. That is the wisdom of God. And so he has taken four, four chapters to bring the Corinthians to a point of humility to say, yes, it is God's wisdom that we should be following, not the world's. And so what he's going to do now is having established that as the foundation, um, he's going to say, now this is how God's wisdom 
It works in specific issues. He's going to now start addressing the very specific issues the Corinthians are having. And so one way to say this is that, you know, things are, are going to get real now. They're going to get real for the Corinthians. They're going to get real for us. Where Paul is going to actually address issues related to how we engage um, uh, the uh, issues of judging inside and outside the church. How we engage our physical bodies, especially with sex Issues of Christian freedom and, and freedom of conscience and matters of how we do church together. And um, as we jump in today, the topic is, con- is a controversial topic tucked into another controversial topic, which is the topic of sexual immorality and uh, what is conventionally known as church discipline, right? And so uh, just to get our, our heads around this idea of, of church discipline, Um, I want to ask you guys, what would you say is the biggest stain on the Christian church? What causes the most harm to the witness of the gospel? And I'm going to argue that it's abusive, hypocritical Christians, especially leaders, of whom the church did nothing about. And so, it's, it's really, you know, I think people can understand and even we can understand there's going to be some people in the church who are not really following Jesus and are not really authentic Christians and are bad apples or whatnot. But where the real pain, where the real disillusionment sets in is when that, those kinds of, of uh, uh, abuses start happening and the church does nothing. And the church covers it up or excuses it or justifies it. That's when the real disillusionment and trauma sets in. And so we can already feel that in the church, there is a need for justice against wickedness within our own ranks. What would that justice look like? And I think Paul gives us the answer here, uh, and he gives it in other places. The Bible gives it in other places as well. So just to bring you into my world for a second, I really labored over this text, like so much so that I forgot that I preached last Sunday. I've been thinking about this passage so much, knowing that it was coming, um, because there's just so much to deal with in this passage. It's heavy. Uh, I want to make it clear. I want to make it palatable for us, uh, and a lot screams out to explain how this fits into a gospel of a loving, forgiving God? How can we be a hospital for sinners, a place that's not judgmental, and yet we're seeing Paul saying, you need to uh, expel someone from your ranks. And he uses really uh, harsh language. And so um, I'm likely not going to be able to address things to your satisfaction or mine. Um, And there's practical questions that require fleshing out And uh, wisdom and sensitivities to different situations that probably are best worked out in dialogue, not in a sermon. So what I want to try to do today is capture the big ideas I see in the text um, to help us get our minds and our hearts around the idea of church discipline so we can see it as part of God's good design for his people that we can walk in joy and security and genuine discipleship towards Christ. So specifically, I'm gonna focus on the posture of church discipline, the principle of church discipline, and the purpose of it. So just a couple preliminaries here. I'm using this term church discipline, and I wanna make sure we understand what that means. And let me give you a definition of um, the type of church discipline, the phase that Paul is talking about of church discipline uh, here in the scriptures. Uh, So the definition is the church as a body is commissioned by God to exercise ecclesial judicial action expressed in the form of public excommunication against a professing Christian in cases of extreme hard-heartedness. So I'm going to need to unpack that uh, throughout the sermon. Uh, But just a a note on that word excommunication, Um, you know, uh, one of the, uh, some of the commentators are understanding that word to mean 
Um, he, he's going to say, don't associate with them. You saw that him say that a few times. The idea there is don't associate with them indiscriminately, meaning you actually need to start having some boundaries within a church context with, uh, some, with anyone that goes through this, including in your home, so don't eat with them. Uh, but that doesn't mean we, we, we ignore them or don't have common human courtesy if we were to see somebody in the street or see them in, 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 uh, in the grocery store. It's not ignoring them necessarily, but it is saying, I don't want to lose the edge of what it's saying, that we need to have boundaries around what is normal Christian fellowship, and that needs to be avoided. I also want to point out that we're going to see this teaching in other scripture. It's not just here in 1 Corinthians. We're going to see Jesus um, also teach this in Matthew 18. He's going to explain what to do when someone sins against you. You're to go to them by yourself, then bring other people with you if, if you cannot get them to see it. And then Jesus says, bring it before the church, right? Um, and so there is a process of escalation. We're going to see that in 1 Timothy as well. When dealing with an elder who is sinning, it's going to ask that you need to have two or three witnesses. So there is multiple people getting involved. And then if they persist, so still hard-hearted, then you bring them before the church. So this is a consistent teaching in scripture that there is a process of healthy escalation from the individual to going all the way to the church in that public setting. Um, and so this is, this is someone that we're talking about that is extremely hard-hearted where there's always, already been a lot of efforts to come to that person, address them, um, and, uh, and they are not listening. And so what we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians is we're at the end of that pattern and process of escalation. In fact, it's overdue, right? And so uh, Paul is saying, uh, you have a man who has committed adultery with his father's wife and you're doing nothing about it, so his stepmother. And you're, so it's overdue. And so I think that's instructive for us that Paul's tone here and posture is, you guys got to get going on this, that likely what, the error that the church is going to commit is that we're going to be passive in matters of extreme sin and hard-heartedness. That's what we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians, is they were passive in dealing with this. They were not being faithful, so he's got to get on them. So that's instructive for us. I want to just also acknowledge that one of the first knee-jerk reactions we're going to have to a teaching like this in our spirit as Christians is to say, who are we to judge and do such a thing? Are we so holy that we would kick somebody out of church? Aren't we not to judge? Wouldn't this be done? Isn't this a tool for the self-righteous and power-hungry leaders to, intim to intimidate and control uh, struggling sinners in the church? And I'm just going to say, first of all, unfortunately, yes, this idea of church discipline has been abused in the life of the church. And I'll just add, though, that all forms of power can be abused and have been abused. The answer isn't to do away with it, but to be faithful with the power that God gives us. But yes, it has been abused. But my argument this morning is going to be this, that as it turns out, to not practice church discipline is actually a sign of arrogance and will likely result in the self-righteous and powerful getting away with abuse. And so when done rightly, church discipline allows the church to uphold the gospel without being judgmental towards sinners or outsiders. All right. So the first thing I want us to see then is that um, church discipline is actually rooted in a posture of humility. So let's look at this in verse two. He says, are you arrogant? Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. What Paul is basically addressing here is not so much the problem of sin or sexual morality, although he will, it's actually the Corinthians' tolerance of it. That's what he is addressing. Their tolerance, they're just accepting it, is he's saying you are being aloof, arrogant to the devastation of what sin is actually doing to people's lives. You're, aren't you rather to mourn or grieve? And so church discipline is rooted in the humility to say sin is worse than we think it is. 
We cannot ignore this. And so sin is worse than we think, but it's also um, more dangerous than we think. So in verse six, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. So notice what he's saying here. You are like this lump of, cle- this lump of bread, this leaven, that if a little bit gets in, it's gonna affect all of you. In other words, it takes humility to acknowledge that as a church, we are not strong enough to withstand uh, the temptations of sin, that we will be affected by it. We will be brought down by it. We will be corrupted by it. So it takes humility to acknowledge our limitations, to be able to uh, deal with this level of sin right in our midst and not be brought down ourselves. And lastly, it takes humility to acknowledge that some people are beyond the capacity of our church to actually minister to um, and so look, look what he says here. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That language is saying that, you know, if they're gonna be, if someone is gonna be that self-justifying in their sin and stay with it and not change, then you need to let that sin take its course. You need to let Satan have his way with that person in their life. And it's gonna lead to a life of misery and pain, which that is what God might use to save them. And so he's he's telling the church, you will not be the one to save them. You have to let this take its course. And so we have a category for this, right? We have a a category in normal life of this idea of enabling, right? So we can think about somebody Maybe it was ourself or someone we care about. We're seeing them in a relationship with someone who is hurting and abusing them and they are staying there with them and, and we're, we're saying, and, you know, you gotta get out of this relationship or you gotta kick them out of your house. You know, like if it's one, a, a child or that's grown up and still taking advantage and we can see that. Um, and so this is what, you know, what Paul is dealing with. It, it, he's saying this is the same idea as you're, you're actually not helping them by just continuing to allow them to do their thing and it's actually hurting you. You're enabling them and it's hurting you. And so as our compassion instinct can set in that we don't want to see somebody, we don't want to bring the hammer down, God is asking us to look at his compassion. His compassion is greater than ours. And so church discipline is entrusting them to the compassion of God that he will work through that process, although it will be painful, and and will save them. He is the one that died for them. He is the one that loves them more than we can imagine. And so we are to humbly entrust them to to the process that God has given us. So not only is church discipline rooted in humility, but Paul is saying it's actually empowered by the gospel itself. So verse six, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. So notice the the imperative, cleanse out the old leaven. We have to do this ourselves and it is grounded in the gospel. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the pattern Paul prescribes is cleanse from among you because you have been cleansed. That is, we need to stay in step with the gospel. If God has made us a new people after his heart, he has cleansed us and given us a new vision to live for his kingdom, then we must work to maintain that identity, which in some cases means we have to protect ourselves from corruption. We're being cleansed by the gospel, and so we have to do sometimes a cleansing work so we ourselves are not corrupted. And let me see if we could, if I could illustrate this. Um, if you've ever uh, gone to the, uh, I'm going to struggle to say this word, the Louvre, Louvre, Louvre Museum. Somebody help me out. The Louvre? No. No. I watch videos on this, you guys. That's not how you say it. 
The Louvre, I can't do it, okay. You know the museum I'm talking about. It has the most precious and priceless paintings in the world from all across history. And it's for the public to come and enjoy. Now, if someone were to try to steal or to um, destroy or uh, vandalize one of those paintings, you can be sure there is a security force behind the scenes waiting to take out that person. In fact, we would say it is foolish and naive to have such priceless, precious paintings and not protect them from evildoers. In other words, the principle that we all understand is you protect what is precious. And I believe that is what this is about. Church discipline is about God wanting to protect what is precious. We are precious in his eyes. He has died for us. He has given his own son. He was sacrificed for us to be his people, that we may experience the joy of our salvation in sincerity and in truth. And God is going to say, I am going to protect that. And so there is a security force that God has raised up. And that is within the church. And that security force is this judicial action that the church is empowered to take in extreme situations that threaten what is precious in God's eyes. His people. And we see this in, when, in Acts when Paul Raises up elders. He says it very clearly. Be careful. There are going to be wolves that are risen up among you to devour the sheep. Okay, so we're talking about um, uh, people that are really going to hurt people in the church. And we might notice at this point that just this judicial mechanism is a public form of excommunication. And there's a lot I can say about that. And I did say I had to cut all of that. But I want to say one thing. Paul is saying that the collective body of the church has a role that is unique. That is the collective body of the church creates something different than the individual members. Specifically that it can pass judgment. And so that's how we can obey Jesus' command not to judge, not to be judgmental, to take out the log in our own eye. That's as individuals, right? Even, even we need to be protect, this, this whole public aspect of it protects um, from the bias of being an individual, even a group of leaders, because it involves the whole church. And so this is really needs to be seen as an empowering, empowering message that as the body, the church, the priesthood of believers, um, that we, God is saying, you can do this in righteousness. I, it's, I am present with you. Jesus says where two or more are gathered, I am there with you. That's actually in the context of church discipline. That's in Matthew 18. And so we are to be empowered to live this out. We are children of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the word of God. Paul's gonna say in the next chapter, you're gonna judge angels. What are you doing? Uh, you got this all backwards. You're not taking care of the issues you should be within your church. And the other issues you have, you're taking outside the church. Now, so the tension we need to resolve at this point is how do we live this cleansing power of the gospel this cleansing pattern of it, without losing our welcoming and forgiving power? How do we live this out in a way that we feel like there's not going to be a witch hunt for struggling sinners? How can we can not be a judgmental church and yet maintain and be faithful in this calling? And so I want to look at the purpose of church discipline. In Matthew here and in Timothy, in Matthew, Timothy, and in this passage in Corinthians, Paul is concerned about ethical uh, issues of behavior. So Christian discipleship boils down to two things. What we believe, that we believe the right things, that's doctrine, right? That we have the right beliefs about who Jesus is, who God is, and that we have the right ethical vision, that is how we behave. In light of who Jesus is, in light of what the kingdom is, in light of God's righteousness, we're to live a certain way. Both the, 
the um, doctrinal issues and the ethical issues, Scripture says, are grounds for church discipline. So if somebody becomes a false teacher, meaning not that they're struggling with the doctrines, not that they're struggling, but they're beginning to teach what is wrong, the church is to take action. In fact, the Bible prescribes a short leash for false teachers. Warn them once, maybe twice, then have nothing to do with them. And so similarly, what we're dealing with on the ethical side isn't someone struggling with sin, but someone who is hardened, self-justifying, making excuses, continuing to do it despite multiple efforts to call him or her to repentance. But what is that ethical vision? What is that ethical vision that is so serious that we'd be willing to publicly excommunicate someone? So we're gonna see the issue of sexual immorality come up here, Um, but to help us understand why it's such a big deal, let's see what he puts it alongside. All right, why is sexual morality such a big deal in the Bible? And let's, let's see how he, in the context, he says, um, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater, which Paul elsewhere defines interestingly as covetousness in Ephesians. So covetousness, right? You're seeking, you're just constantly lusting out, out after what other people have. You're a reviler, which is another way of saying verbally abusive. You're a drunkard or a swindler. Not even eat with such a one. And so we see sexual morality along these, alongside these other sins. If you take sex out for a second, do we see something that they kind of have in common? These are all matters of someone taking advantage of someone or abusing someone or being extremely neglectful of their responsibilities for their own selfish gain. In other words, these are matters of injustice. Someone is getting exploited. Someone is being taken advantage of. And now, curiously, sexual morality is in that category. Why? Let me give you a brief definition of sexual morality. Sexual morality is sexual activity outside of God's design for sex. That's God says this is what sex is for, so anything outside of that is immorality, and God's design is that sex is for a man and a woman committed to one another in a lifelong marriage relationship. This is the definition of that word sexual morality in the Greek is pornea, and so Paul and Jesus use that uh, framework of, any, of what pornea is, anything outside of marriage. Now, Paul will get more specific. He'll call out very specific forms of sexual morality, especially next chapter. But what I want us to see is why um, is it such a big deal, right? And Andrew's going to unpack in the next few weeks why God has designed sex with these parameters so we can understand it and embrace it. Um, But because it also warrants church discipline, I want to discuss one of those reasons today. One of those reasons is that human beings are sacred to God. Human beings are of the utmost importance. We think the Mona Lisa is important. We have a security force for the Mona Lisa. What do you think God feels for human beings who he's created in his image? Now we can see that, um, we can see this pretty clearly with the issue of swindling. And we can see this pretty clearly with uh, stealing and reviling. We can see how the human being is being abused in a way that we say, that's wrong. You're taking from them. We can see that, but what about with sex? Why is that in that category? And so, why is that a taking? Why is sex an injustice? Yeah, maybe it's not out of sight of God's design, but what's this, why is it in the same ballpark as, as being a thief? Listen to this in 1 Thessalonians For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual morality, for that that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother. No one take advantage of his brother. No one um, 
uh, exploit his brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. You see, the Bible views sex as a taking what doesn't belong to you. And the reason it can be hard to see it as an injustice is because usually it's consensual. Most of us do not consent to having something stolen from us. We don't consent to being swindled. We don't want to be the victims of someone's greed. We all don't like that. But sex, we do consent to, usually. Of course, we also know and can see very clearly that when sex is not consented to, that is clearly uh, abuse and injustice. That's not how Paul's describing this. All forms of sexual morality. First of all, I want to be clear that usually in a relationship, power is not distributed evenly. There's usually a vulnerable party, even if someone both agree to sex. But even if it is consensual to have sex with someone, what's happening is that person is opening up to you in the most intimate way possible. In the most intimate and vulnerable way In fact, it's so intimate and vulnerable as the one song goes, to sever that is to set a forest fire in a person's soul while you watch it burn. Feel free to let me know if you can guess that song. And you are the pyro. To have sex with someone and then leave them. The Bible says that is one of the worst pains imaginable. And so the Bible says this, Don't you dare take from someone until you have pledged your life to them before God and man in a legally binding way. A human being and their bodies in that way are worth your whole life's commitment. Anything less is abuse. Anything less is injustice. It's taking advantage. You are a swindler and a thief and God's judgment is on your head. That's what the Bible says sexual morality is. Now there is forgiveness and redemption. I have sexual immorality in my past. I was a swindler and a thief myself. And we're gonna get to the hope of the gospel, but for now, I want us to see why sexual morality is on this list and why it's such a big deal. We absorb that teaching into our conscience. So a question may arise at this point. Regarding these other sins, how do you tell if someone is greedy? Did you guys catch that? We're gonna excommunicate someone for greed. Who's gonna make that judgment? Or how do you know someone's covetousness? How can we tell? Is this just another, is this gonna be another witch hunt? Can we venture in a way that's, that's hurtful to judge people's hearts. But by framing it, by framing church discipline as a counter to injustice in the church, what we are looking for is not the heart, but the evidence of these heart issues. All sin leaves a trail of destruction. Have you ever worked with someone that was full of greed and selfish ambition? I bet you it felt like hell. I bet you you felt like you were being taken advantage of. Someone might say, I'm just drinking, I'm just having fun. Well, ask their spouse and their kids how they feel about their parents drinking. Elders are required to be thought of by outsiders, meaning they have to treat people fairly in their workplace, in their home. This is big, this is important in God's eyes. In fact, in James, he's gonna be very specific. He's gonna say, if you are rich and you do not give fair wages to your employees, to the people who are working for you, that is evil. We can see the victims. We might not be able to judge greed, but we can see its effects. What we're looking for are the victims. When people start coming forward, having been abused and beaten up by bullies and swindlers and thieves, God is giving the church a mechanism to deal with that, to uphold God's righteousness for all our sakes, especially the aggrieved party. So we might be tempted to look at church discipline as powerful people rooting out poor, struggling sinners, and it can be twisted into that. And man, do I hate that. 
feel tempted to name some churches and pastors that are doing that in our age. I'll avoid that for now. Please don't ask me (laughs) in case I spill the beans on that. That's horrible. But what I want us to see is it's designed to be the opposite. The proper practice of church discipline is designed to protect the vulnerable by rooting out oppressive people in our own ranks. Usually that means someone in some kind of position over, uh, in power over someone. And so let us not walk in blind aloofness or fearful passivity, not when it becomes clear that there are bullies and abusers and swindlers in our own ranks. And so what we have to reckon with, of course, is do we have the courage to do that? And that sexual immorality is included on this list. That's a tough one. And I see just one other kind of protection before I get to what are we supposed to do with all this. And it's actually a protection from church discipline that I think is important to note. And that is church discipline does not apply to outsiders. The principle of not judging outsiders, which Paul states clearly here, should give us a high amount of hospitality, patience, and encouragement to those coming to explore faith. There should be no expectation to conform to the ethical vision that Jesus commands his followers if they don't yet know Jesus. Let's help people meet Jesus and be changed by him. But even if they're coming to re-explore faith, again, when someone comes into these doors, we want to show that hospitality and that non-judgmental attitude. And regard, so regarding people coming into the church, we want to value the journey they are on and be sensitive to where they're at on that journey. And so we know that Paul here is concerned with professing Christians who have become hard-hearted. Determining that requires a lot of thought and prayer and wisdom and a lot of relationship. And so beyond that, we, it's hard to go into the practicals of what that would look like. Again, probably better done in relationship, in the real circumstances, in dialogue. So how can we respond to this? So this is a, yeah, hard, hard to think about this, but I want to start with by saying, don't underestimate the power of grace. Paul says, such were some of you, but you were cleansed. The whole point of the gospel is there is hope for swindlers. There is hope for thieves. There is hope for those of us who are stuck in lust And so the point of this passage is not to scare you out of the church, but to point you urgently to look at what Christ did for you on the cross, who offers you fullness of love and cleansing power. I imagine if you uh, are struggling or in that place of being a swindler and a thief, you are feeling the weight of it yourself. It is breaking your bones. It is destroying your soul. And you feel like far from God. And God is saying, I am speaking to you as the one who loves you. Come to me. I will not turn you away and neither will we as a church. For anyone who's willing to confess their struggles no matter how bad, we are a church that will be there for you. We will be a church that will go to the mat with you in that struggle. But conversely, it means don't harden your heart to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about that issue, don't turn to be self-justifying. I remember being in that place with sexual immorality, being comfortable and happy with it, and then God began to convict me. And you know the message, you know what it really was? It was God saying, very personally me, Paul, is it me or her? Are you gonna follow me? And so I felt, honestly loved by that, challenged obviously, but God is calling you to himself to experience more and more of him and that's the whole point of church discipline is that we would be a church that is safe for sincere seekers, sincere believers, that we're doing everything we can to protect each other from abuse. But I hope that means the spirit is speaking to some of us to not harden our hearts And I think lastly, I'll say this, is that, you know, this passage, I think, is a call to deeper discipleship. How do we disciple one another 
towards the ethical vision of how we follow Jesus together. It's that important. We have to think about what does it mean to be a member of the church? There's a lot of responsibility on members to care for someone, to care for each other, both in, in the pain of life and in the joys of life, but also when, when sin begins to creep into some of our lives and the deceitfulness and the hardness starts to set in. We need to be members who are encouraged and are empowered to enter into each other in love. But sometimes it's gonna mean having to go even further, right? Because we need to figure out how do we maintain this balance of being welcoming and to be a hospital for sinners, but not neglecting to uphold God's righteousness amongst us so that we aren't corrupted and we are a safe place for sincere seekers and believers. I encourage you, if you have questions about this sermon, makes you think a lot, or things I didn't explain, I encourage you to reach out to me or Pastor Andrew about this during the week. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pray. Violet will come up and, um, and we will do our best to wrestle with this truth and um, help, hopefully it will help lead us to what I am trying to argue is um, a place of joy and safety uh, for, for those of us seeking Christ uh, sincerely. Lord, um, we want to receive from you sermons like this, passages like this, that call us to some of the more difficult um, uh, calls of discipleship. Lord, we remember that when the call to follow you means we have to pick up our cross, we have to deny ourselves Lord, we all have to confront difficult aspects of our life. We have to say no to certain things we would want to say yes to. Say yes to certain things we may want to say no to. And so, Lord, we need to trust that the wisdom that's come from you as the one who gave his son, who died for us, who shed his blood for us, who put in us his Holy Spirit, Lord, that you, your wisdom is above our wisdom. Let us be willing to become fools for Christ. Lord, that we may achieve the vision that you've given us, that we would be a place that celebrates the joy of our salvation in sincerity and truth and is not corrupted by malice and evil that we are unwilling, aloof, and afraid to deal with. But Lord, that's gonna require a lot of wisdom. It's gonna require a lot of conversation and require a lot of discipleship on our part. And so help us to um, live into this vision that you've given us. And Lord, so we pray this in Christ's name, amen.